Jim's story is unusual uh, from the standpoint that he had such a brilliant beginning. When he became famous, you know, it's not necessarily whether you're good or not, it's whether you're lucky. So uh, he was both. The second thing that's rather unusual uh, is that Jim walked away from his career in 1970 uh, when he was really on top of it. I believe he's not just an old master. In fact, he's like a very young person. His image making uh, is very, very fresh. It's leaping off into a new direction, and it's mind-boggling. Anyone who questions whether truth is stranger than fiction need only consider the story of James Gill. Hello, I'm Forrest Sawyer. Those who knew him growing up here in San Angelo, Texas, never imagined that the soft-spoken boy they called Jimmy would, with just a few others, define contemporary art in the 1960s. There was no early indication that Gill possessed the kind of artistic talent that would later create original works featured in Life magazine, or on the cover of Time, or hanging in the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney, and the Smithsonian. I did this triptych of Marilyn Monroe with like nine images behind uh, the three images of her, like uh, black and white photographs. And uh, so he called me up at the end of the month and said, okay, I'll come out and see what you got. And he saw those Marilyns and he said, fantastic. He got them, put them in his car, went home, made a reservation, flew to New York, Museum of Modern Art bought them. And uh, January of 63, Life Magazine reproduced them. Now in the art world, this is unheard of, especially from a major gallery. I mean, it just, almost never happens. And it was the only time that Felix Landau ever did that, that an artist walked in off the street unannounced with no idea who this person was. And Felix immediately took him on. A month later, he, he signed him up for the gallery, immediately started dealing his work. So I went from a country bumpkin <laughs> to uh, kind of a lot of fame and movie stars and everything within two months. Now, the Sao Paulo and the exhibit where I'm just looking at some of the names that were there. Uh -huh. You got James Gill, Robert Indiana, Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, Claes Oldenburg, Robert Rauschenberg, James Rosenquist, Ed Ruscha, and Andy Warhol. All in one exhibition. Right. That's astonishing. Right. And that was before the, all, everyone's fame took off. That was, um, that was kind of a major show, in a way. Did you know that then? Yeah, kind of. I was really, really proud that I'd been chosen for that because the thing, there was the top 20 artists of the United States and I was one of them. James Gill's work resonated with the Hollywood creative community. Gill fondly remembers the day he was invited to John Wayne's house. So I walk in, he said, hey Gil, come down here, you know? And he said, how are you doing? He said, have you had breakfast? And I said, yeah, I hadn't had breakfast. I said, yeah, I'm okay. And he said, well then join me. You want the same thing I've got? I said, sure. So he got about a 12 inch tumbler, filled it up with bourbon. <laughs> and so uh, I kept up with Duke all day long, you know, filling up those glasses. Interest in Gill's paintings dealing with cultural figures and political issues began to widen. And so he was quickly sought at by other museums, curators in the country, from the Chicago Art Institute, from the Whitney Museum. Other places were starting to pay attention, and when their acquisition budgets could afford to do so, they would contact Felix Landau. We wanted Jim Gill in our collection. And once you're knighted by the experts as being key player in this world of contemporary art, the other museums follow suit. And uh, that happened to Jim. So in 1970, at the height of his career, Gill decided to leave the city that had catapulted him to national and international acclaim. 
I think the fast lane at a certain point did him in. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, psychologically he needed to move away from it. He just literally dropped out of the art world. Had a garage sale, sold his paintings, which infuriated, of course, Felix Landau, who had been supporting him all these years. I mean, Jim just hit a wall and said, that's it, I'm out of here. I, I came to the conclusion about something. All of these people that I, were meet, that I was meeting <clears throat> that were rich and famous were not happy, <laughs> you know. And the artist, you know, you look at how many artists were happy. Van Gogh, very few happy artists. I thought, well, you know what I want to do is to be happy. It's not the fame that makes you happy. It's not the money that makes you happy. It's just being in tune with your life, whatever you're doing. For a decade and a half, the celebrated artist lived in tranquil obscurity with no plans to return to the art world. Until, ironically, the day he was inspired by his work in architecture. I was designing houses on the computer. I learned AutoCAD and all the technical things and I would see what would happen on that and make a mistake and say, wow, I wish I could do that as a painting. I wish I could uh, paint that or get that shape or, you know, and then finally, oh, click, why not? One of the things that I've really been working on the last um, five or six years is trying to merge portraiture and abstract, because I love both of them, both of the paintings. I think artists want to merge the two, the figurative and the abstract, and I think I'm doing a pretty good job of getting this uh, on the canvas. You know, an artist's job is to shake it up. He's still alive, it's still alive, he's shaking it up. very pleased with the new work and uh, it, it hasn't been seen much yet but I think it definitely will be. It captures a sense of popular culture. It doesn't just render it in a flat way. His sense of color, his sense of a subject, his ability to render, to draw, um, his sensitivity to color and to design is very strong and I think that's why he's important. The thing I appreciate the most, admire the most about Jim Gill's new work is the complexity of it. Whereas the, with the simpleness, the, the simplicity of the pop art and the complexity of this, his new work, you know, is, is compelling because you want to study it. You want to look at it over and over again. Is it fair to say that in a way you've become uh, freed, that you're not attached to ideas and therefore your images, your colors, your sense of shape, of line can rise to the front. It can go anywhere. There are no rules to what's on that canvas. Now before, when you're a, when you're a political commentator, you know, then you're trying to tell a story or get something across. Now I am just trying to blow my mind and anyone else that wants to look at it, you know. I love to paint. I like to wake up in the morning to get started. At night I say, well, hurry up and get this sleep over with so I can, you know, get into a new painting. Because every painting is really kind of um, an experience. The man knows how to make images. He's an image maker. And all the artists that I've known in my lifetime who are the real deal are people who are just fanatical about making their art. He is. That's why I think so much of his life and his image making is in the future, not the past. With the reemergence of his new work, and he'll certainly become better known and rediscovered, which the art world also loves to do. They love to rediscover people, and Jim's a classic case of, of, of an artist that should and will be rediscovered.
while others predict big things for James Gill. He says he's just happy to be back in San Angelo, doing what he loves. So Jim Gill has come home. Yeah, definitely. Period. Period. Yeah. Not going away again. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, with my life, I don't know where I will be five years from now. But for right now, I'm right here.